you'll turn with me in a Bible to Exodus chapter 2. Exodus chapter 2, as we look together at verses 1 to 10. Having finished working through Luke 24 and the teaching there on the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are returning to the heroes of the faith, the hall of faith we see in Hebrews chapter 11. And the next figure we see in Hebrews 11 is Moses. But before we hear anything about Moses and his faith, we are first told about the faith of his parents. In Hebrews 11, verse 23, we read, By faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born, because they saw he was no ordinary child. And they were not afraid of the king's edict. While I didn't exactly plan it this way, I can't think of a better scripture for Mother's Day either. Here we have two women and one girl who are used powerfully by God to preserve the life of Moses, the one God raised up to deliver his people out of slavery in Egypt, thereby serving as an example of the deliverer, the Lord Jesus Christ, one greater than Moses, who delivers God's people from the slavery of sin. These women are used powerfully, and we're told that it's by faith. Faith is at work here. But there's an element of faith evident here that we don't typically associate with faith. And that is the element of defiance. You think of defiance when you think of faith. Do you think of opposition or resistance or confrontation when you think of faith? Well, the example of Moses' mother challenges us to consider the fact that faith without defiance is dead, to borrow the words of James, when he says faith without works is dead. If you have faith, it will be evident in how you live and what you do. And one of those works will be defiance. Is defiance present in your life today? Well, to understand what's happening in chapter 2, we have to understand chapter 1, verse 22. There we read, Then Pharaoh gave this order to all his people. Every Hebrew boy that is born, you must throw into the Nile. But let every girl live. So that's the background. An edict has gone out from Pharaoh. Every baby boy is to be thrown into the Nile River. No exceptions among the Hebrews. And so we pick up our reading in chapter 2. Now, a man of the tribe of Levi married a Levite woman. And she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. But when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. Then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe, and her attendants were walking along the riverbank. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her female slave to get it. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying, and she felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. Then his sister asked, 
Pharaoh's daughter. Shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Yes, go, she answered. So the girl went and got the baby's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this baby and nurse him for me, and I will pay you. So the woman took the baby and nursed him. When the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. So in defiance of Pharaoh's edict, Moses' mother, named Jochebed, and we know that because of the genealogy Moses gives us in Exodus chapter 6. His father's name is Amram, and his mother's name is Jochebed. She defies Pharaoh's edict by hiding this baby for three months. And as we all know, after three months, babies start getting a little more mobile. Right? They start moving around. It's harder to hide him when the Egyptians come looking. So she puts him in an ark. And we cannot help but hear associations of Noah's ark. This is a miniature of Noah's ark. And she coats it with tar and pitch, and she places it among the reeds by the bank of the Nile. And And these days, almost everyone in Egypt lives along the Nile. This is the source of life and vitality for all the people. And she's no doubt hoping that she can continue this for some time, continue to hide him. She doesn't know how long, but she's hoping this can be a safe place among the reeds. And then Pharaoh's daughter maybe hears him crying and and finds him. And we're told that she has pity on him. She feels sorry for him. She sees him as a child in need. And she also defies the edict of her father. And in God's providence, it turns out that Moses' own mother, Jochebed, gets to continue to nurse him and raise him. So he continues to have the influence of his mother in his life. But there's defiance throughout all of this, defiance of Pharaoh, defiance of the law, defiance of what would have been customary, defiance of what seems safe or probable. And so we need to ask the question, why is defiance necessary for faith? Why is defiance necessary for faith? Why is it that the defiance of Moses' family is highlighted in Hebrews 11 as the kind of defiance that should characterize the lives of all God's people who demonstrate saving faith. Well, it's because we live in a world filled with people like Pharaoh. And it's not that Pharaoh was just mean, Of course he was, but let's think about his reasoning for doing this. And we have his reasoning given in Exodus chapter 1, verse 8. We know that the people of Israel are living in Egypt because Joseph, the last character we saw, who was sold into slavery by his brothers, led them down there. He said, there's plenty of food down here. You all should come down in this time of famine. And they prosper, they multiply there in Egypt, but then a new pharaoh comes into power. And this pharaoh has a very different mindset, a very different posture toward these Israelites. And here's what he says in verse 8. Then a new king, to whom Joseph meant nothing, came to power in Egypt. Look, he said to his people, the Israelites have become far too numerous for us. Come, we must deal shrewdly with them, or they will become even more numerous. And if war breaks out, they will join our enemies fight against us, and leave the country. We've got to do something. And he gives instructions for the Hebrew midwives to kill the baby boys. We have the example of two Hebrew midwives who also demonstrate defiance of Pharaoh because they fear God more than they fear Pharaoh, and God honors them. But what I want to highlight is Pharaoh's reasoning, his logic for doing this. 
it's not just that he hates Hebrew baby boys. It's that he sees his power as threatened by them. He's worried that if they multiply, well, then they'll outnumber us. And if they outnumber us, then we're threatened. And if they become allies with our enemies, what are we going to do? We're in trouble. And so undergirding Pharaoh's reasoning is a cheap view of human life. What matters in Pharaoh's mind is staying in power. What matters in Pharaoh's mind is that Egypt remain dominant. And if some Hebrew baby boys get in the way, so be it. They are expendable. He is not. And the method for doing this is to throw them into the Nile. And there are probably two reasons for that. One is that, could there be a cleaner way to dispose of some baby boys? You throw them in the Nile, they're gone. No cleanup necessary. They're gone. Another reason is that the Egyptians deified the Nile River. And probably they see this as some kind of offering to the god of the Nile. And no doubt they justified this by saying that the God of the Nile is pleased by this child sacrifice. Either way, he doesn't think these babies matter. He has a cheap view of human life. They are expendable. And he's willing to say that the end justifies the means. And this is the rule throughout the land. And yet we have Moses' family defying that, placing a high value on human life. We're told that when Moses' mother sees him, she says that he's a fine child. She hid him for three months. And the Hebrew here is a very common expression. And it's the same expression Moses uses throughout Genesis chapter 1 to say, the Lord saw that the light was good. And it literally says she saw that the child was good. He's pleasing in her eyes. And it's the same kind of natural affection that we would hope any mother would have toward her baby. And yet in the New Testament, it is implied that there's something different about this child. Maybe they have a sense that God has big plans for this child. God is going to work powerfully through this child. So both her natural affection and an undergirding sense of promise for this child drives her to defy Pharaoh, to place a high, costly premium on human life. And she defies him. Protects her baby boy as long as she can. Uses her wit, uses her ingenuity, defies Pharaoh. But we have to go beyond Pharaoh because it's really not Pharaoh per se that's the problem. The mindset of Pharaoh is very much alive and well and with us now. And this is because of the truth we read in 1 John chapter 5, verse 19. The whole world lies under the power of the evil one. And so we don't understand this world and the nature of this world and the principles and the powers that are at work in this world until we acknowledge this whole world lies under the power and the influence of the evil one. That's not how it was in the beginning, but that's how it is now as a result of the fall because we all have chosen to listen to the evil one, to give him a foothold in our lives and in our hearts. And as Jesus says in John chapter 8, he was a murderer from the beginning. The truth is not in him. When he speaks, he lies. His native tongue, his native language is to lie. To say, you're not going to die if you eat that. God didn't really say that. No, 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 no. Pharaoh, you got to do what you got to do to stay in power. That's what's important. So what if some Hebrew babies have to die? Think about the greatness of Egypt. That's what matters. He 
he was a murderer and a liar from the beginning, and he still is. And we can see his handiwork all over the world. And so the question for you and for me today is, is there faith in you to defy the power of the evil one or not? Remember, it's been said that only living things fight against the current. Dead things just float. They go wherever the current leads, wherever the majority leads, whatever most people are doing or thinking, that's where you go. But living things fight against the current. They strive against the current. They defy the current. They oppose it. They confront it head on. No matter what the consequences might be, and that's what we see in Moses' family here. They're willing to confront this cheap view of human life, this expendable view of human life. That's why defiance is necessary for faith. If living faith, saving faith is present in you, then this kind of defiance will be present because these forces are bearing down on us all the time, everywhere. And while we don't have to worry about a pharaoh, if it's not a pharaoh, then it's a Caesar. And if it's not a Caesar, then it's a king. And if it's not a king, it's a wannabe czar. And if it's not a wannabe czar, it could be a president. It could be anyone or anything that stands in opposition to God. And when that choice presents itself to us, after we have rendered all the obedience we can, after we have rendered unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and Caesar, even Caesar, is worthy of respect from his subjects. But there comes a point where in order to render unto God the things that are God's, we must say, I cannot follow Caesar here. I cannot follow the way of Caesar. I cannot take that view of human life. I must defy it. I must oppose it no matter what the cost might be to me or my reputation, even when doing the right thing is dangerous, deadly dangerous. So that's why defiance is necessary. The next question I want to pose is, what does defiant faith look like? What does defiant faith look like? What can we learn from the example of Moses' family? It looks like Fearing God more than you fear Pharaoh. And we need to know that we all have an innate fear of Pharaoh. We all have an innate fear of being left out or marginalized or posed or threatened with violence. And this is where we have to remember the words of our Lord Jesus. Luke 12 Verses 4 to 7, he says, don't fear the one who can destroy your body. I'll show you who to fear. Fear the one who can destroy your body and your soul in hell. That's the one you should fear. And he is the one we see these Hebrew midwives fearing. As you read in Exodus chapter 1, verse 21, and because the midwives feared God, He gave them families of their own. They feared God. No matter what Pharaoh threatens to do to us, no matter what Pharaoh says, God is worthy of our fear. And fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. This is the starting point for understanding who you are and where you stand in this world. A reverent fear that leads us to bow down to God, to say, God, you are God, I am not. I humbly submit to whatever you command. I'm not worried about what they can do to me. I fear you above all. Is that fear present in you? And then, having this defiant faith looks like serving as a passionate advocate for life, all life, whether that life is related to you or not, as we see in Pharaoh's daughter, who adopts 
Moses as her own. And we know she adopted him because she named him. I didn't plan it this way, but as God's providence would have it, I'm preaching on this scripture when the legality of abortion is being hotly contested and debated in this country as a result of the leak from the Supreme Court this past week. And it is not my desire to wade into the fray on that. The church is not a political action committee, and it is not my job to tell you how to vote. It is not my job to side with any particular political party, to engage in any partisan politics. That is not my role, that is not my job. But I am a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that means my job is to proclaim the whole counsel of God. And where Scripture speaks, God speaks. And where God speaks, God's ministers must speak. And I fear him more than I fear you or anyone else. And so I must speak. I must address the value of human life from conception to natural death. This is a core, an indisputable biblical teaching and value. However, in this country we have two dominant parties. We're in a two-party system. And that means the way you vote and the calculus of how you cast your vote in a two-party system can get very complicated. This is not the only issue to consider. It is one vital issue to consider, but it's not the only one. There are no perfect parties. There are no perfect candidates. May God give you wisdom as you cast your vote. However, what I'm advocating here is the principle that life begins at conception and that every life, every life from conception to natural death matters and is precious to God and should be treated as life. Now, some, of course, will say, well, it gets very complicated. It gets very complicated, and I acknowledge that. But I'm not addressing this as a dispassionate observer who debates this intellectually. In my former capacity as a hospital chaplain, I found myself in the room with parents who had agonized over this decision. And it was my job to pray with them and minister to them, whatever their decision was. It was also my job to go to the lab afterward and to offer a prayer of thanksgiving to God for that life, for the remains of that life, however brief. I've seen this up close and personal. And when I speak to this, I fully acknowledge the complex nature of it and the pain and the agony that it presents. It's not simple. But what is clear and what is simple is the value of human life. And however this gets legislated and however you vote, this principle has got to stand out. Life matters to God, every human life. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. And this especially matters for the lives that are so easily forgotten, the lives that are so easily overlooked, the lives that seem inconvenient to the power structures of this world, the lives that seem dispensable. And you think especially of the lives of the disabled. You think of the lives of immigrants and refugees. You think of the lives of senior adults. You think of the lives of the terminally ill. And in each case, what we're up against is the viewpoint that would say human life and the value of human life should be measured based on what you can or can't do. And once you can or can't do something, well then, we're not even sure if you're really a human. And we start to wonder, what is your contribution? Maybe 
Maybe we don't need you. We can overlook that life. And for those who are marked by this defiant faith, we cannot afford to do that. We must be zealous and passionate advocates for all human life and the preciousness of all human life and every human life without exception. I am unashamedly for life. And, you know, so many people worry about what is the majority opinion? What do most Americans think about these issues? You know, right and wrong cannot be and should not be determined based on majority opinion. We don't count heads to determine what is right or wrong. It doesn't matter what the majority of people in Egypt think. If there is a life in front of you, do you see the innate dignity and worth and preciousness of that life? No. Wherever it is. And so, moms, women, there are children around you in your midst. And God has called you to serve a very particular, unique role in their lives. To point them to himself, to steer them in what is right, to steer them away from what is wrong, to hand on the faith once for all delivered to the saints, to be an advocate for life without stutter, stammer, or apology. Are you that kind of advocate, or are you more worried about what Pharaoh says or thinks? Make no mistake. Faith that does not defy the world, the flesh, and the devil is dead. If this kind of defiance, this kind of opposition against all that opposes God is not present in your life, then you don't have saving faith. This will be present in those who trust in this God and fear him above all. But remember, this doesn't depend on biology. Pharaoh's daughter looks at this crying baby and shows him mercy. She knows he's not even from her tribe, so to speak. She knows what her dad might think about this. She knows the trouble she could get in for preserving his life, and yet she's driven by a desire to preserve and save life. And she does. And I hope and pray that for those of us who want to preserve life, who advocate for life, are ready to put our money where our mouth is when it comes time to care for orphans, to care for hurting mothers and families in desperate need. Are you ready? Is this just a political viewpoint or is this a principle, a heartfelt conviction for you? Time will tell. That's what defiant faith looks like. It looks like fearing God more than Pharaoh. It looks like passionately and zealously advocating for life, whether they're yours or not. And then we see, how does God honor and use his people's defiance? How does God honor this? Look at how only God in his providence, his sovereign providence, could orchestrate what happens here. Moses' sister, Miriam, we're told her name later in the book, in chapter 15, she's watching. And so she goes to Pharaoh's daughter and advocates and says, you're probably going to need a wet nurse for that baby. I think I know somebody. And so she goes and gets his own biological mother so that Moses is able to be raised by his biological mother, as long as he can be, and he has the privilege of being an Egyptian by adoption. And so you see how he is uniquely qualified to serve as God's deliverer for his people to defy Pharaoh and say, God says, let my people go. And to lead them out. He's one of them, and yet he has a bridge to the Egyptians. You see how God is working all this out. And we see the same thing happening when the Lord Jesus is threatened by another Pharaoh figure 
King Herod, who also feels that his power is threatened. So what does he do? Kills every baby boy in Bethlehem under the years of two. And so Joseph, father of Jesus by adoption, takes the family down to where? Egypt. (laughs) Egypt. And so God preserves the life of his people by preserving the life of this deliverer. This is all for the purpose of saving life. God, the God of the Bible, is a God who gives life and who preserves life and who saves the lives of his people using a deliverer, using a mediator. And here's where we have to bear down on our own hearts. It's one thing to defy Pharaoh. It's one thing to defy a Caesar. It's one thing to defy a wannabe czar and say, isn't that terrible what he's doing in Ukraine? And see how cheap of a view he has of human life. That's one thing. But for the believer who has been born again by the power of the Holy Spirit, for the person who is trusting in Jesus for salvation, We have to know that the defiance starts with defying sin within. Consider these familiar words from John 3, starting at verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light. It will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. God. We don't come into this world as morally neutral people. We come into this world as people who are drawn to the darkness. People who want to avoid the light, who want to hide from God, who want to suppress the truth about God and about ourselves. And it is only through the intervention of the Holy Spirit applying the work of Christ who came to gave, give his life as a ransom for God's people. It is only by that work, by that intervention, that we're pulled into the light, we run to the light, and we want God to see us. Never mind Pharaoh, never mind what he sees or thinks. We want God to say, well done, good and faithful servant. Is that the desire of your heart? So before we worry about this legislation or this politician or this Supreme Court ruling or this dictator or this other leader, look at your heart. Look at your heart. Are you defying the power of sin, the power of darkness in your own life? Or are you giving it free reign? Because you're more comfortable that way. It's just easier that way. It's more convenient. You might have to change everything. Or do you say, in light of what God has done for me in sending his one and only son to die on the cross for my sins, to be raised to new life so that I can have eternal life in him, I owe him everything. He is Lord. I'm going to live for him no matter what. No matter what they do to me or do to my body, my life belongs to him. Whether I live or die, I belong to him. that defiance, that fight present in you. I'm afraid we don't emphasize the fight of faith enough. It is hard. Sin runs deep. It is powerful. You've got to resist it. You've got to oppose it. That lie is continually in your mind and in mine saying, did God really say that? Is that really best for you? Are you sure you can trust that? Are you sure God is good? It's in you. It's in me. It's in all of us. Oppose it. Defy it. 
power of the Holy Spirit working in you. May God, like you, mark me out as people who have defiant faith. All for his glory. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we confess that we are so lost apart from you. We are helpless. We're in darkness. Our hearts are blinded by our own sinfulness. We think we know what's right. We can offer our opinions about any number of subjects, but Lord, we confess that we don't. We need you to enlighten our hearts, to enlighten our minds, to show us clearly what your will is, to show us clearly what is right and what is wrong. And I thank you, Father, that by the work of your Holy Spirit, you bring about this defiant faith in your people. And I pray that you would do that here in this place. And I pray especially for moms and grandmothers and, and the women that you've placed in our lives. I pray that this defiant faith would be present, that, that they would stand firmly upon your word, that they would remain steadfast in handing on this faith to the next generation, no matter how much opposition they face, no matter how many times they've tried it and, and seemingly failed. Lord, keep them steadfast by your spirit, for we pray this in the name of the only one who can save a wretch like me and a wretch like her. Jesus Christ, your son, our Lord. Amen.